Welcome to the Fantasy Football Sackos Podcast with your hosts, Jason Shawcross and Alex Krog. Let's go! Fantasy Football Sackos back for episode 17. You may notice, well, Jason Shellcross, welcome to the show, everybody. You may notice that Alex has changed in both appearance, name, and Twitter handle. We welcome our first podulterer, Gabriel Miramontes, to the show what from going on? First I Round could've. Fantasy, special guest. Yeah, I could have, uh, he has a beard, so I mean, I could have just shaved and been like, this is what I look like underneath the beard. Don't. So- don't credit what Alex has as a beard. That thing is not a beard. It's a life form that exists on his face. Oh, man. Same thing. It's just like full <laughs> handlebar for me. Nothing up here. It's awful. I hate it. So, but uh, thanks for having me, man. I for appreciate For all our it. listeners, Alex is out. Just had a child. Congrats, uh, Alex. Now graduating from Sacco, Sack Daddy, as we've been mentioning. Um We've we are lucky enough to have uh, Gabriel Miramontes join us again from First Round Fantasy. We're going to be talking comeback and breakout players for 2020. And we also, I mean, today's been crazy in the fantasy or well, even regular football news world. So we're going to talk about some new stuff at the end. Um, but so Gabriel Miramontes, First Round Fantasy, um, recent friend. We uh, we actually met because of fantasy football. This is our first interaction face to face. He actually reached first round fantasy. Reached out to us, the Sackos. We're doing. We're going to announce to the pod. We are. Do we it, are. Man. We are joining a. Uh, we're, we're, what are we calling it? Up and coming fantasy football podcaster. Fantasy football. The title isn't the catchiest. All no, right? it's not. It's a little it. lengthy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I should have shortened it. And abbreviations wouldn't have worked. So just, it is what it is. Just deal with it. It's, it's going to be great. And that's what matters. But uh, It's going to be fun, man. And we're happy to have you. We got, and thanks for having me. Of course. We got 12 fantasy football podcasts all coming together. All new people up and coming. Uh, starting a fantasy football league. We're going to talk a whole lot of crap probably try and live stream the draft if we can which is i think next wednesday consensus on that it is august the 5th 9 p.m eastern 6 p.m pacific standard time i'm sorry i don't know your standard centralized time 8 p.m well, central it's it's, it's, it's cool that's what it is <laughs> <laughs> um but so there's gonna be a lot more coming out on that we got a lot of goodness coming it's it's fun i mean you guys are basically the masterminds behind it so thank you for including us uh in it the exact opposite man thank you for joining it's it's gonna be a fun time just a way to help each other grow and promote each other and uh kick some butt at the same time there you go all right so without further ado let's get into these comeback and breakout players of 2020 um You're joining. I don't want to be rude. I feel like guests go first. So why don't you tell me who your (laughs) comeback player is for this season? Yeah. Oh, I appreciate that, man. That's a very, uh, that's a very fine gesture. I appreciate it. (laughs) Well, we recently did a pod about this same issue and I'm going with the guy that I talked about there. And I love this player. I think he's incredibly talented. Obviously, he's a comeback, so some people are going to say, well, he wasn't talented last year, but uh, he is definitely due for a comeback year, and that is Juju Smith-Schuster, wide receiver for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Oh, I see you shudder. What's up, man? No, that was a shudder of excitement because if anybody, like, if you have not listened to any of our podcasts, like, go back. We've, like, the, I feel like. We are so excited about the Steelers. I feel like in three of the first like four podcasts, we did nothing but sit there and talk about how pumped we are for <laughs> Big Ben to come back and to get rid of Mason can't fall out of a boat and hit water Rudolph. So <laughs> like we, we, we're ready. So tell me why you're so pumped for Juju. Yeah, well, now I feel bad because I feel like you guys have heard all the news already. You've no, heard all no, the no, reasons. I'm, I'm excited for your take. Yeah, well, I mean, just looking at it, when Juju came into the league in 2017, the guy was immediately, he played second fiddle to Antonio Brown. And when you play second fiddle to Antonio Brown and you're as good as you are, you're going to have success. 
And he did. And in 2018, you could argue that was his breakout year. 166 targets, 111 receptions, 1,400 yards, and seven touchdowns. That is wide receiver one numbers. And that's what it's all about for fantasy, right? And then 2019 happens. R.I.P. <laughs> Big Ben Roethlisberger goes down. I mean, I don't even know how you go from 160 or 110 receptions to 40 receptions and 500 yards. Um, and it's just sad. It's just sad. I, I have so such high hopes for the kid. I follow him on like Instagram and Twitter. I got and him I on TikTok. Like I got, I, yeah. The guy is hilarious. I follow I him everywhere. vicariously through this young kid, man. And I love him. I absolutely love him. Uh, but there were a few reasons why he underperformed last year, and I don't think it was necessarily all his fault. Again, you guys may have talked about this, but I mean, I think the big outlier here was Big Ben was, he was out last year. He injured, didn't play the season. Therefore, he ended up with some lackluster quarterback play with Mason Rudolph, and I always forget the other guy. Oh, Delvin Hodges. Duck, um, Duck Hodges. Duck Hodges, Delvin Hodges. I Googled it. I didn't even remember his name. Dodge, so I had to dip, it. dive, suck Hodges. And that's, <laughs> that's what we got going on over there in Pittsburgh, man. That was brutal. Yeah, man. It, it just summed up the dumpster of fire of a season with those quarterbacks. And that's putting him mildly. Only for, yeah, exactly. Not only for Juju, for the entire receiving core and at times James Conner. I mean, it's just when you can't throw the ball, defenses pick up on that and they're going to find ways to stop you. And that's what happened to the Steelers all year. Uh, luckily for them, their defense kept them in all year long. And if you played the Pittsburgh Steelers defense like I did, you wound up with some pretty nice points from them week in and week out. Absolutely. Uh, the offensive side of the football was not the same. You can't say the same for that. Uh, so, yeah, that was my first reason, obviously. Big Ben out. My second reason is Antonio Brown is gone. Now you thrust Juju into the spotlight, right? He winds up on the outside. Well, if you look back, Juju Smith-Schuster never lined up on the outside with Antonio Brown. He was a slot receiver. All that damage he did in 2018 and 2017, he did from the slot. So you put him on the outside. You put him with bad quarterbacks. It's basically, you kind of see where I'm going here with the end result, right? It's just not good. No, they couldn't Um, get the ball to him. They couldn't get the ball to him. And he was also battling a couple of nagging injuries throughout the season as well. So if you had a hand in poker, Juju Smith was the worst hand in poker. I don't even know what the worst hand in poker is. I don't know, two, four, seven. I I have no idea. Just the worst hand in poker. He was Uh, a consensus, like, top ten going in top 10 at the position and you know sneaking into people's like top 15 overall going into last season could you imagine if you ended up with james connor because he was again (laughs) top 10 and you like man you have to be turned off like completely stay away from these guys but yeah i mean he's two years away from a a post having uh, what 1400 yards like just and you that shouldn't go overlooked. It, those are incredible numbers. Big um, Ben wasn't there. He's back now. Yeah, and that's the thing. People are going to say, well, hey, you know, Tom Brady over there in Tampa Bay is turning 41. He's got the vegan diet. He looks like a saint. <laughs> and you look at Ben Roethlisberger, and he's 38. He's hammering six packs uh, daily, although he says he hasn't taken a drink in a few months, so good for him. <laughs> but, I mean, he just – He's a different kind of man, but at the same time, that has what that is what has made him great. He's always been the big, burly quarterback that can stay in the pocket, that is not afraid of taking a hit because most of the times he doesn't go down. So, I mean, it. I just think that Big Ben for years was an upper echelon quarterback, and he's out for one season, and people are going to say, well. Injury is preventing him from being as good as he could be. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that. Top echelon quarterbacks are top echelon quarterbacks for a reason because they have a proven track record. And I think just because of an injury um, doesn't necessarily mean he should be X'd out of this season. So I have him having a good fantasy season too, by the way. And I love his current ADP going right now on Sleeper at 44. I'm sorry, 45th. Like that is... 
That is such value. We're talking end of the fourth round. Like the guy could easily finish as a top 10 receiver and you could get him in the fourth round. Yeah, so, 100%. The value. To what, the value is tremendous. Uh, the value was not tremendous last year. To piggyback off of what you no. said, I took Michael Thomas in a 10-team dynasty startup. I had the 10 pick. Took Michael Thomas at the 10, Ooh. turned around, picked up Juju as my second wide receiver. Oh. Off the bat. It hurt. It hurt. Oh, it hurt boy. Uh, one last thing I will mention about why I think Juju is going to have a bounce back year is – just who he, he is now surrounded with. I mean, you look at Ben Roethlis coming back, and I hate to put the dependency on Ben Roethlisberger for this entire Steelers team to just have this enormous comeback year. But that's really the way you have to look at it. And a couple of the things that they had they have done is, well, they spent a second-round draft pick on Chase Claypool. He's an go. outside receiver, deep field threat. They have Deontay Johnson there, stretches the field. And they have James Washington there, stretches the field. Those three guys lining up on the outside and on the other side of Juju are going to open up that slot middle of the field where Juju thrived for two years. It's going to be open season harvest. Reports are already coming out that he's moving away from the outside. They're putting him back in the slot. And I just think all signs point. Like, first of all, you can't go anywhere and up, anywhere but up from last year. So 100%. It shouldn't even be comeback. It should be. It's like mandatory. It, there's <laughs> literally nothing else he can do but go up. The only way he does um, he finishes lower is if he has some catastrophic season-ending injury. We're gonna knock well, on some you wood about knock like, on some wood, man. You can't, I'm, be, I'm saying, you like, can't be saying bad juju. <laughs> See, Juju's like, only got good juju this season. I'm not the only one coming up with the good one-liners over here. Uh, I got some zingers no. too. All right. Um. I'm interested for your take on this because I genuinely have no idea which way you're going to go. But like we exchange, so we know each other's comebacks and breakouts. My comeback player for this season, like there is no middle ground there. You either love him or you hate him. And it is Todd Gurley is my comeback player. So Todd Gurley is consensus or Alex and I's rankings is our consensus 20. Uh, 20th overall running back ESPN has him ranked as running back 18 his current ADP is 37th overall so the first pick of the fourth round uh, going as currently the 22nd running back off the board Mm. so there is like this much respect for Todd Gurley who (laughs) finished as running back 14 last season like he finished as 14 running back 14 last season on like a reduced uh reduced workload what he only had like 55 percent of the uh all ran 55 and a half percent of the team's total carries last season um yeah, and he's, he still saw over 200 carries i think which, two, yeah I mean, almost two and a quarter yeah. granted that's it was only 33 less carries than the season before and almost and only 56 carries less than his mvp worthy 2017 season um his last five games like Sean McVay flipped a switch and said, what am I doing? Why am I not using Todd Gurley? Started using him more halfway through the season and the switched from 11 personnel also to 12 personnel more halfway through the season too. However, for the last five games in LA, he averaged almost 18 attempts per game. He had 300 uh, total yards, 310 total yards, uh, averaging uh, three and a half yards per carry, five rushing touchdowns, had 10 catches for 93 yards and another score. The guy was averaging 16 and a half fantasy points a game over the last month, month and a half of the season. And that's like, that's RB1 territory. And mm-hmm. he finishes running back 14 on the season. Now you trade him to Atlanta. And he's on a one-year special, hot five million bucks. To, a lot of money. Y- yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's res- it's respect. I mean, it's respectable. I meant that as far sarcastically. As, yeah, it's respectable. It's just respectable. <laughs> like for what you're running backs are so underappreciated in the NFL for the work that they do. Unless you're and, Christian McCaffrey, like that's unless it. you're CMC. 
uh, or Zeke, I guess. But most yeah. running backs. I mean, look at look at Derrick Henry's recent contract. Just like yeah, compared to what the other two guys, it's just like Ew, come on. But Gurley's he's only twenty six. He's not thirty. He's not like. <laughs> I'm sorry. He has he has a knee concern. Were it not for that, like the guy would be instantly ranked in the top twelve everywhere. Well, he wouldn't have been traded from the Rams either. But that's neither here nor there. Or let go and free to free to sign uh, with Atlanta. Atlanta. Listen to this running back room: Brian Hill, gross. Ito Smith, gross. Kadri Allison, gross. Maybe a semi-capable goal line back. Um, they only have 122 total rushing attempts between them. None of them, I don't think, like barring Gurley's health, I don't think he splits carries. I don't think he really comes off the field unless he's tired. Um, Atlanta ran the ball 362 times last year. And I think really if there was one team I had to pick out of all 32 teams as being decimated or most affected by injuries, uh, not the key injury that we just talked about with Big Ben. Obviously, you lose your quarterback. Like, there goes your season if it's one of the upper echelon guys or, you know, top half. Um, but Atlanta had 18 people on IR last season. Mm. That yeah. Six of them were starters, including two offensive linemen. And that doesn't even include the most a new trade. Okay, so you're really talking seven start like seven starters were out for Atlanta last year. And then you have an additional on top of that, you have four other offensive linemen that missed time. Like Atlanta mm-hmm. couldn't pass protect, Atlanta couldn't run the ball, Atlanta really couldn't do much, and then they lost Keanu Neal, Desmond Trufant, and Takaris McKinley, three defensive starters. Like they were down in every game. No wonder they threw the ball almost seven hundred times last season. Hopefully they get back healthy. They drafted Matt Hennessy out of Temple Center in the third round. I mean, I don't know if they're going to keep him at center with Alex Mack there. But either way, health, I think, will help them this season. Todd Gurley, I don't think, has anybody threatening him for touches. And as far as his health of his knee, which, again, is the only question I feel like surrounding Todd Gurley, Matt Ryan said that he fits in nicely and he's looked really physically healthy. He's looked great moving around. They pass him on his physical. They're going to pay him the money as long as he doesn't get COVID and like, like unless a barring some catastrophic injury, like the guys, he's the guy to me. So I just don't see how he finishes. I don't, I don't see like if you could get him in the fourth round, the workload there, I think he has a, a really good chance to to be a, a wonderful comeback player and have a nice bounce back season this year. Well, do you agree or what are your thoughts on Gurley? No? Yeah, there's really nothing that you didn't mention that I didn't like. He's a tremendous value in the fourth round. Um, however, I mean, yeah, the knee issues are It's just are the thing. knee. He, he passes physicals. I understand all that. But in, in this league, man, to a running back, knees are everything. You need knees <laughs> you to play. Know? You need knees you need to be knees on the field. To play. You need knees to play. And that's one of the things that steers that makes me steer clear away from him. Yeah. However, um, I mean, in the fourth round, that's such a tantalizing option to possibly draft a guy who's with that potential and could get you a top eight, top five running back year he could be your third running back at that point and you could just throw him out at flex and he could end up being a starter like that's that's crazy value yeah name value alone i feel like people are gonna take him where take him when they see him yeah but uh i mean it's it's crazy value man i I love the pick i love the pick if i if i'm sitting in the fourth round and i only have one rb off and i've you know taken maybe a tight end or or a running back already and a wide receiver and I'm looking for my second running back, I, I'll take him in a heartbeat. 
Yeah. Or crap. I'll probably take them regardless. I, your, your, <laughs> your advice has I just talked you into Todd Gurley. You, you just talked me into Todd Gurley. <laughs> so if he's there in the fourth round, I'm probably taking him. I understand the concern. The concerns about the knee are valid, but like he held up last season. He gave, he ran the ball as much as they gave him the ball. And f- over the last two months, I mean, the guy's averaging more than 17 rushing attempts a, a game. And he's on the field and getting the targets and the catches too. I mean, he held up to it last season. Granted, like he has lost a step, half step, whatever you want to call it. I understand he is not the same dominating force. However, all I am saying is that for fantasy football purposes, if you can get a starting three down back at the end of the third, beginning of the fourth, who is going to have opportunity after opportunity, like I don't think they're going to take him out in goal line situations. I don't think they're going to take him out really ever unless he's tired. So I think he's the guy there. It's just whether or not the knee holds up. And if you can get that value, even though if he's even though he's not the same dominant force he once was, I think that he's right now. I think he's being drafted closer to his floor than his ceiling. And so for that reason, I feel like I feel like he has a great chance to excel and could be an excellent comeback player should he exceed the uh, the current ADP expectations. But that's a great way to that's a great way to put it. You've done a good job, my friend. You've done a good job. (laughs) Wow. <laughs> on that, I'm on the Todd Gurley hype train now. Let's go. All right. So let's move on to some breakout players. So these are guys that obviously they didn't slump, but we think that they're going to take it to the next level this season. And Gabriel, I'm going to turn it back over to you here. Who's your breakout player for 2020? Oh, man. People, like you said, you know, these aren't people that necessarily slumped last year, but they can certainly improve. And one might argue, well, this guy broke out last year. Um, and I will argue to counter that, that, oh, no, the breakout is coming this year. Yes. Um, and I'm sticking with the wide receivers, and I'm going DK Metcalf, Seattle wide receiver. Let's go. This guy is a monster of a human being. 6'4", 229. I love me big-bodied receivers in fantasy football, those goal line pr- uh, prowess players that are going to seek near there and – Soak up those targets in the end zone. I love it. Um, You know, when we look at DK Metcalf last year, it was very, very similar to Tyler Lockett, who was his counterpart over there in Seattle. And I'll go over with Tyler Lockett's targets first. He saw 110 targets last year, uh, and he made the best of it. 82 receptions, 8 TDs, over 1,000 yards. DK Metcalf? Right there with him, 100 targets, so 10 targets less. Now, his catch percentage wasn't that great. He only had 58 receptions for seven TDs and 900 yards. So you could argue that he did more with less. But, I mean, just look at that there. If he That conversion, seven touchdowns on 58, that's insane. It's insane, right? It's insane. And I played a little game uh, on my podcast – a couple of days ago. So I'm going to play it with you right now. <laughs> All um, right. I, I love my big body wide receivers okay. or tight ends for that matter. I love them. Now I'll ask you this right here, Jason, who do you think last year led the NFL in red zone targets as a team or at, as an individual, as an individual player. And when I say red zone targets, I mean inside the 20, which is considered the red zone. Okay, I'm going to say it's not DK just because <laughs> I'm going to say it's not DK, but like there's so many guys that come to mind here, like Zach I'll Ertz. Give you, yeah. I'll that, give you two guesses. It is not Zach Ertz. Uh, but good guess. That's a great guess. Uh, man. All right, I'm going to stay at the position, and honestly, I'm going to – I'm going to go with his teammate. I'm going to go with his teammate. I'm going with Lockett. Well, if you went with his teammate, you got it right. Ding, 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 ding. Good for you, my friend. Tyler Lockett last year led the NFL in red zone targets, 23 of them, uh, which gave him number one on the list. 23? I didn't know it was that high. Yep. And DK Metcalf had 17 red zone targets, which put him at number 14. So when you look at that as the whole – 
Russell Wilson was able to support two individual wide receivers in the top 15 last year in red zone targets. That's there was nuts. no other team that had two players in red that led the league in red zone targets that were in the top 15. So that brings me to my next point. Russell Wilson is, I'll say this for the third time, super efficient. Um, he has maximized, he has maximized the value of his wide receiving core. And DK Metcalf is a direct result of that, as well as Tyler Lockett. Um, as I mentioned, they are the only two teammates to be in the top 15 in red zone targets. Lockett last year finished as the wide receiver 13. Uh, and I think DK Metcalf finished as a wide receiver 30. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility to say that they switch roles this season. I was going to say, I think that flips. I think like, that flips. DK's second year, Josh Gordon is gone. Like, I would not be shocked at all if that flips. Yeah, I, exactly. I feel in my bones that DK Metcalf sees an increase in targets this year. Um, and even if it's just 10 more, the only thing that he has to work on is his catching percentage. Instead of 52 receptions, give him, I don't know, 20 more receptions, 72. I mean, those are great numbers. And that always leaves the possibility of more red zone targets and more conversion with those TDs. So I just think that he has tremendous upside this year. Um, and I know that people are going to say, well, Seattle is a run heavy team. I understand that. But I want to challenge goes, that too, though. Go, go on. Go ahead. Do it. Let's hear it. So I'm saying Rashad Penny is out. Rashad Penny is rehabbing. Rashad Penny hopefully comes back halfway through the season, probably starts on the pop. Like homeboy needs to get healthy. Okay. <laughs> He's not the only one though. It's Chris Carson too, though. Like he had a significant hip injury that he is still recovering from. Hopefully he's healthy eventually. And they, they signed who Carlos Hyde. Like he's not the answer for anyone. Carlos stone hands. <laughs> like, so if you're, if you're hurting at one position, then maybe you try and make it up in other ways. Maybe they are a little less dependent on the run and maybe they let Russ cook as Alex says and let him you know run the offense a little bit and make his own plays and and, and really lean on those receivers especially now that you have DK Metcalf uh, who had a huge rookie season and really come into his own in his sophomore year I really could see for a lot of reasons uh, a shift maybe not for the whole season but at least out of the gate for the Seahawks as guys are getting back healthy that would really help you know Lockett and DK have huge starts to the season and so I'm right there with you I think DK is like the better long-term um receiver for the Seahawks than Lockett is Most um, definitely. Yeah. but but like DK could have a huge year huge year the ceiling is – there is no ceiling for DK Metcalf. No. The guy can jump through the roof. And I'm actually glad you mentioned that because I did read a recent Beat Reporter article that said uh, they are hypothetically – you know, there are rumors that they want Russell Wilson to loosen up a little bit, kind of let him off his leash. There and we if go. they do that, this is one of the most accurate quarterbacks in the NFL. Oh, my God. So, right then and there, if they're going to unleash him – Easily, I can see 125, 130 targets for DK Metcalf, and that's just gonna you that getting, just skyrockets his numbers. I was gonna say that's like almost wide receiver one value at that point, like that many targets. And yeah. if he has a higher share without Josh Gordon there too, like it's gonna be nasty. There's really no threatening tight ends there that are gonna take away. And I don't want to hear about Greg Olson. Like I don't. So <laughs> I'm pumped. I'm pumped for what the season could be for DK. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. And that is my breakout for this year. Uh, I will hand it over to you. So I have I have watched a couple of podcasts of yours, and uh, I am not pandering to my lovely co-host who is helping me out by joining me here. But my, I I this is going. my breakout <laughs> player is a Raider. It is Josh Jacobs of Raider Nation. <laughs> I think he's a locked and loaded top six, top five running back this year. I don't really see a way that he finishes outside of it. Um, 
he's our consensus running back eight, but that's for other reasons. Like that's that's I I am not responsible for him being consensus running back eight for the Sacco's rankings. Uh, ESPN <laughs> has him ranked. ESPN has him ranked down all the way at running back eleven, which is atrocious. Um, the world disagrees with ESPN. He's currently going uh, ninth overall and as the seventh running back off the board. So again, the world's agreeing with the ceiling that Josh Jacobs had. The guy's 22, second season out of Alabama, 5'10", 220, like perfect size comp- body composition to be that three down bell cow. Has the hands, can do it. He was finished his running back 18 last season. He missed three games. He averaged, so he finishes as running back 18 with missing three games. He averaged 14 fantasy points a game, which was running back 13 production. Running back, uh, overall running back 13 finishing production as far as a points per game that he actually played value. Did I mention that he played like half of his games with a broken shoulder blade and was... <laughs> Like literally going in, like he would score or get tackled and brought down, land on it, have to run into the locker room, get shot up with Novocaine, run out, and then run for another 80 yards. Like the guy was a machine last year. Um, He had five games over 100 rushing yards, and he had a sixth game at 99. Like the rushing yards are going to be there. That was That's not a question going into this season. They have an excellent offensive line. He had 10 fantasy points in 9 of 13 games that he played, 15 in 4 of 13 games. 15 or more fantasy points in 4 of 13 games. So you're saying a third of his games, at least, he's gonna, he could go over 15? That's incredible production. And what did he lose to? Like, what did he lose out on? He lost, he lost out on... Second and long, third and long, and like the hurry up offensive uh, passing or a hurry up offense, two minute drill, one minute drill situations were when Josh Jacobs was off the field. Gruden got criticized for it all year, and he said, Well, we're going to get him involved more. We're going to get him involved more. And towards the end of the season, you saw that, but then he was so unhealthy to the point that they couldn't put him in. And mm. so, and then he sits out, and so you have DeAndre Washington filling in for him who finished last year with 40 targets 36 catches and 292 yards he's gone see you later in kansas city maybe you can help out that situation <laughs> now that uh now that damien's opted out but that's we'll, we'll get into that in a couple minutes <laughs> But DeAndre's gone. I'm not worried about Jalen Richard. I'm not worried about the th- third string running back from last year. They got nobody backing him up. Gruden set, spent all offseason saying Josh Jacobs is a three down back. Josh Jacobs is going to be in on third and down. He's not going to come off the field unless the guy physically cannot be there anymore. As mm-hmm. far as his efficiency, like... Go to player profile their top type in Josh Jacobs. As far as player efficiency, the guy was in top 10 in every statistical category. He was eighth in evaded tackles. He had 81 and averaged more than six uh, evaded tackles per game. He was third on the season in big runs with 13. He was third, but he only played 13 games. He averaged one big run a game. Um, he was ninth in yards created. He created 463 yards on his own, which is 35 and a half yards per game that the guy Man, created with race. his own skill. Like the guy is insane. His skill set is insane. Now he's going to be a three down running back. DeAndre Washington's gone. I'm not worried about Jalen uh, Richard. The guy to me, like if if I am drafting, like there are only a few people I will take over Josh Jacobs. Dalvin doesn't have a contract. I'm not sure. I I will probably take Dalvin over Josh, but it's with hesitance. I would love it if Dalvin, who's still working on a contract, gets one before the season starts. That would make or, well before I draft realistically. But like <laughs> you have CMC, uh, Saquon. Zeke, Dalvin, and then what? Michael Thomas. And then after that, it's like, man, Josh Jacobs looks good right now. 
Like he does. He doesn't have the questions that Sanders has. He doesn't have the questions that Drake has. He plays third down. Derrick Henry doesn't. I understand Derrick Henry's a stud, but like Josh Jacobs is a stud. And I just, I really think that he could easily finish as a top five running back if he gets the, you know, much vaunted didn't get it last year third down passing down work i the guy has all the tools so yeah well, definitely not far off from what i think i have him right there in like six to eight range yeah. so i think he can definitely squeak in there and i'll toot his horn just a little bit more if i have to come know, on raider nation you know, lay it on me not, right he was the first rookie to run for 100 yards and two scores in his first game the only other work, or he was the second, sorry. The only other rookie to ever do that was LaDainian Tomlinson. So, 2-2. Two, two. There we go. He's the first Raiders rookie to ever rush for over 1,000 yards. 2-2. Two, two. Here we go. Uh, and not only that, like you had mentioned, he missed three games. Well, guess what? Only next to and only behind, I should say, Derrick Henry and Nick Chubb, did he garner or average more rushing yards per game. So you're looking at a guy who missed three games, was third in the league in rushing yards per game. That is insane. Yep. That is insane. Yep. And you look at where Nick Chubb and Derrick Henry are going. They're going before him, uh, which I guess you would say that, okay, that's perfectly fine because you just said he's third on that list. But I think the upside is there. Um, And a couple of other things I will mention, you know, with the Oakland Raiders, Oh my goodness. It, it's been a long time coming. There are tremendous changes. Yeah. Las Vegas. I just feel like the change of scenery, um, Gruden in his second year, there are things that are brewing. I do, however, see that this is Derek Carr's making or break a year. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. You don't invest that much in a backup quarterback in Marcus Mariota if you don't plan to use him at some point or at least send a very powerful message to your QB1. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't know if you remember this. They came out of the same draft class, and that's when uh, John Gruden used to do his QB grinders. Oh, yeah, right. Well, guess who he had ranked higher than – guess who he had ranked higher? He had Marcus Mariota ranked higher than Derek Carr. And then he goes out and gets Derek Carr six years later. So, I just think oh, that man. there are a lot of things bearing on the shoulders of Derek Carr. Um, Josh Jacobs is a direct result of that. Derek Carr needs to have a good year, which is – I talked about uh, in a previous podcast, Darren Waller. Oh, my gosh. Be on the lookout because if you need dependency and you're working for your life, you're going to throw to the guy who's going to catch the ball the most, and that's Darren Waller. But off topic. Um and, I mean, I just see him being very dependent on the run game as well to stay safe, manage his throws, and that is a direct correlation to Josh Jacobs' success. And hot take, if Mariota takes over, you know, at some point, if Derek Carr just can't keep it up, shits the bed. Ooh, apologize my language. All good. <laughs> but if he can't do it, I feel like Marcus Mariota is a better fit. Yeah, he's going to come in. He's going to scramble a little bit more, but it just makes that offense that much more dynamic. And you see a situation where Mariota is forced out of Tennessee thanks to the emergence and second coming of Ryan Tannehill. I think that's a very possible situation that we have here in Oakland as well. The second coming of Marcus Mariota. Derek Carr doesn't shape up and shut up. Changes of of scenery have been known to help football players be better at football so don't be surprised at all if if uh, Derek Carr struggles out of the gate that they mm-hmm. might eventually yank him um, but and coming from a Raiders fan yeah that no hard feelings there see you later Derek <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say like so we've we've been talking um, and, and this will dovetail nicely into our next thing we're gonna we're switching over to news we're, we got a lot of news going on right now um, really all because of COVID and offseason moves but so Damian Williams of the Kansas City Chiefs has notified the Chiefs that he is opting out this season and so the Clyde Edwards Hilaire hype train was already in motion and I feel like it went from a nice little 
Like it was kind of going downhill and a little bit gaining steam. And then Damian Williams opted out. And now it's like straight down plummeting, going 6 million miles an hour. Welcome to the Clyde Hilaire, Clyde Edwards Hilaire hype train. Like get on or, you know, lose your seat. I don't, I don't even know. Like, so there's talks now. It's like, would you rather have, because this is, we're in coming up on draft season at the beginning of August. Would you take Clyde Edwards Hilaire or Josh Jacobs in a fantasy football draft? Oh, before I answer that question, All let right. me just say this. Let me just say this. Two days ago, I did a podcast and Clyde, I did, we did bust picks. Well, guess who was my bust pick? <laughs> bust pick. Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Uh, for the reason that I thought he was going insanely too high in drafts. Uh, with so many other bodies there, DeAndre Washington, we mentioned earlier, Damian well. Williams, Daryl Williams, yeah, Daryl Williams, right? So many other bodies there, and with a COVID, with a COVID shortened off season, I was looking at all rookies with a grain of salt. Yeah, I, I just didn't think it was possible for rookies to produce like they have in years past with less time to really study the playbook and learn the systems. Uh, that's just shows you how fast news changes because I don't think that anymore. No, I mean, you could have argued that he would have been the RB two and played second fiddle or at least shared committee for those first few weeks in Kansas city. Uh, that doesn't really happen anymore. He's now in the most high powered offense in the NFL. And he's an RB one. I mean, he, yeah. In my argument the other day, he was a 2.9, 3.1. So right there in the back of the second half, early third round. Now he's guaranteed to shoot up to at least, I I, I don't even know. He's going to be going, first, I think, yeah, back of the second. first, early second. I think he's going to nestle in right at the turn. And I think the only reason that he nestles in there, I think he probably – in most leagues will end up getting drafted top half of the second just because nobody is going to want to pull the trigger on a rookie who won't have any preseason and you won't actually get to see the guy play against NFL caliber talent like so it's going to make some I think a lot of drafters nervous to take him in that first round yeah but my argument I could see how he does I could absolutely see how he finishes as a top 10 top 12 running back and is an RB one. He's in the most prolific offense or one of the top two. If you want to count the Ravens in prolific offenses in the league, but he is five, seven. (laughs) The guy is five freaking seven. Like, you said that was like a bad thing. I'm 5'8". I get it. I no, get it. I get I'm it. At the I goal get line, it. if you got six, seven, <laughs> four hundred pound dudes trying to fall on you, maybe, maybe they put Daryl Williams in at the goal line. Is all I'm saying because when Damian Williams got hurt last year, they didn't really turn to Lashawn McCoy. They more or less leaned on Daryl Williams, who, to our knowledge, has not opted out. Um, and so I'm just I'm worried about I'm worried about. Obviously, well, Lashawn's obviously gone now too. Uh, our next bit of news: he uh, has now signed with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Tampa, Tampa, whatever you want to call it. Uh, <laughs> so, Damian's opting out. Lashawn's gone. You got Daryl Williams, DeAndre Washington, and Clyde edwards hilaire I'm not sure if he gets the goal line, but I don't really know if it matters. I think he has to be efficient to score at least on the ground. But I think that their offense is so spread out. Like, you know, the, the hyper yeah. always I'm glad running, you mentioned that always I'm running that hyper active two minutes spread offense. I just, I don't see a way that he, he's, he's still on the field, although he might not be getting the carries at the goal line. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, Again, I'll say it for a third time. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, when you look at an offense like Kansas City, you think, oh, man, that that's a good one. I look at it similar in coaching style. I, I think of the Patriots and how Bill Belichick yeah. is a mastermind of offensive capabilities. And that doesn't necessarily mean, hey, I have one weapon. You have an assortment of weapons. And that's what's good. That's what makes NFL teams great right so you look at kansas city and you have um you have andy reed there same type of coach 
He doesn't care about your fantasy team. No. And up until two years ago, before Kareem Hunt went and kicked a girl, I mean, we haven't seen a workhorse back yet. Right. They've been a committee backfield, and people are just still so juiced on them because of that high-powered offense. So you're likely to get, you know, a weekly flex play or a, maybe a high-end two on a really, really lucky day. But if you look at that team last year, sure, they had Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey who finished as a tight end two, and Tyreek Hill who finished up there in the top 10 or 11. They definitely had their bust week, so nobody was consistent on that team. You had Kelsey, who had a lot of great weeks and a few really dud weeks. And the same can be said for Tyreek Hill. And I think that's going to translate to the running back position as well, Uh, which is why, to answer your question, I think I'm going Josh Jacobs on the basis that he's such a consistent, more dependent value uh, in that same draft capital area, which they are now going to find themselves in. And I'd rather have that consistency than that high bust, high reward type of player. Like if I'm looking for that kind of player, that's like seventh, eighth, ninth round when I'm looking for that high end flex play. And I just think, again, especially with a shortened off season due to COVID, you know, even if he is thrust into that role, that's still a huge learning curve to undertake. And, you know, week eight on, that guy's going to win you some seasons, most likely. Yeah. But you but have to get him right now. I think you have to get him in the second round to get him, though. Yeah. And you don't want that. Like I don't want that. I don't think there's a chance that Andy Reid puts in a rookie that hasn't played in a game or any game experience on third downs for the first like month of the season, protecting your half-billion-dollar man in Patrick Mahomes. I don't think that that ha- like I don't think that happens. I'm sorry. Like, maybe I'm wrong. I could be. I hope I'm wrong for everybody that's already drafted him or does. Like, I just. And then Daryl Williams is bigger. I'm just. I'm still worried about it because I know DeAndre Washington is a capable villain. He showed he was capable last season when he filled in for Josh Jacobs. Like he, the guy's not a slouch. If any, I think he's either on par or better than Lashawn was last year. Like, mm-hmm. so. I'm still worried about Clyde Edwards Hilaire. The hype train is rolling and it's rolling fast. And I, I just, I think I'm going to miss him. I would, I would take Josh Jacobs over Clyde Edwards Hilaire. I would take Miles Sanders over Clyde Edwards Hilaire. I would take Joe Mixon over Clyde Edwards Hilaire. I would take like all of those guys. And so for that, like I'm, I'm going to miss him because somebody's going to be like, Kareem Hunt was running back number four in this offense, and I want running. And like, okay, go for it. This guy's five seven. <laughs> He's not going to be running it in at the six inch line. Yeah, so. I mean, all of those running backs you mentioned, I think I'd rather have. Uh, this is particularly the redraft I, in a dynasty league. That could be different. Oh, oh in a dynasty, dynasty league redraft. Yeah. I mean, that's that's running back. That's number one overall pick now. But, yeah. Uh, in, in a, I mean, redraft this year, yeah, I, I'm going to let that hype train, like you said, just, just just go right on by. In a dynasty league, the way I answered it, somebody put out a, a, a Josh Jacobs, Joe Mixon, Miles Sanders, and Clyde Edwards Hilaire dynasty. Who would you take? And my answer was... Long term, I think all four of those guys generally have the same role, except Joe Mixon doesn't get the passing down uh, responsibilities because they have Geo. But the other three could potentially be three down backs. So at that point, I'm probably picking the best offense, which would be the Clyde Edwards Hilaires of the world. It's just for redraft for this season. I am. I he's my he's the you know in fourth out of those four guys just because. You have to take him as he's going to finish as a top 10 guy, and you have to draft him there. But I don't think he produces as a top 10 guy to start the season. So, yeah. All right. We already touched on it. LaShawn McCoy has signed with the Tampa Bay Bucks. Buccaneers, what do you think that this means for Ronald Jones and Keyshawn Vaughn and the Buccaneers offense? Are you running out to draft LaShawn McCoy now? Oof. That's a good question because it's so fresh on my mind. I will start off by saying this. Tom Brady gets whatever he wants. He pulls <laughs> Gronk out of retirement. He gets the two best receiving duos in the, probably the league. Uh, 
And I mean, not to say McCoy is washed up by any means. He's still a serviceable running back in this league. And now you put him in arguably a very dynamic offense. I mean, I think he's going to find success right off the bat, though. I mean, I I don't know if I'm taking him anywhere close to where I think he's going to be back. I mean, yeah. with this news dropping, I don't even know where that puts him. Maybe like sixth, seventh round type area, I'm guessing. Um, there was a lot of hype around Ronald Jones. Uh, Tampa Bay came out and committed to Ronald Jones. Well, not anymore, right? Right. Um, clearly, that's not the case. We did a podcast a couple of weeks ago in which we did bold predictions and I loved Keyshawn Vaughn coming out of coming out of college. He had pass cape he had pass catching capabilities and I thought he was gonna be that new James White for um, Tom Brady. I don't think that happens anymore. So it just really? goes to show how fast and how quick things change. It seems like you think otherwise. Let's see what you gotta say. I am probably going to own Keyshawn Vaughn in every league because. Oh, I'm, I'm happy you say that because like I said, it was a bold prediction and I stood by it very hard. I've watched this tape. The guy's amazing. He's a stud. I don't stud. think one signing He's a stud. of an older veteran running back is going to change my mind on that. I'm just saying it persuades me in a different direction. It, it doesn't completely move me, but right. the wind is blowing. What I will say is I think it addresses their, especially because of COVID, early season need to add somebody that is a more or less, well, it's LaShawn McCoy, so I'll say less capable running back (laughs) given LaShawn's performance last season. I mean... I, I will say this. I mean, if you are so high on Keyshawn Vaughn, that initial news, I mean, I don't think... He's the deepest of sleepers now. I think people assume that he gets buried into that backfield. Oh, yeah. Um, with this news. So I might even argue to say that you might even be able to pick him up on free agent wires the day after the draft. Yes. That's, Especially and that's what I'm. Yeah, that's what I want to talk about is I think you can get him in like the 13th round before you draft your kicker in defense to finish your drafts in redraft. I think you can add what could be a second of the half like a second half of the season win your league kind of guy i think he has more skill than ronald jones does i think ronald jones is going to have the locked in workload to start the season considering mccoy has to learn a new offense and then you have Keyshawn vaughn obviously a rookie a very talented who i feel like has more talent i just feel like it's a matter of time And I feel like all the LaShawn McCoy signing does is add length to potentially the time where Keyshawn Vaughn presents real value. But I think his talent is too great to really keep him out of off of the field for the entire season. Um, I just I feel like maybe like there is no more of an upside dart throw at the end of drafts than Keyshawn Vaughn. (laughs) And like so I will take it is all I'm saying. If there's a back to own in that backfield, um, dynasty startups, dynasty redraft is Keyshawn Vaughn. Yeah. Redraft leagues, I think, I don't know. I'll have to see after all this dust settles where McCoy is going in drafts. Um, but I mean, a lot of people were hyped last year when he ended up on Kansas City. Yeah. And he was not very productive. No. So that could be a similar thing. He could be here for a veteran presence, like you said. Um, And, you know, like I said, I think we just have to wait to see where the dust settles on this. Uh, But the back to own is probably Keyshawn Vaughn in Dynasty. And I think in redraft leagues, I'm I'm probably going to go Ronald Jones if I'm looking to get out of the gates hot. Yeah, right. Exactly. But it also takes away from Ronald Jones. And I don't I don't. I don't know. I don't know if I want him anymore. As much, well, at least it's not not maybe not as much as I did. We actually just did like a we do sleepers, studs, and sackos because we are the fantasy football sackos. So, that, <laughs> so that's like you know your studs are the guys that are already good who we think are going to have a great year. Sleepers are guys you can get late, and then sackos we think are either being drafted at or above their their ADP ceiling. Um, and we've we've talked about Ronald Jones extensively for how we think he's primed to have this fantastic season, largely because of COVID. And so, mm-hmm. 
I'd like him a little bit less with the LaShawn, but I think, again, like you like you said, I agree with you, Gabriel. I think he comes out of the gates hot. Um, hot takes. That's all we give here. Hot takes on hot news. There we go. Our last bit of hot take, hot news. <laughs> so, I, I, wish, I wish I didn't tell you before we started recording, but the Buffalo Bills sent all of their rookies home today because they had five rookies <laughs> test positive for COVID. Uh I don't really know what the reaction is other than, damn it, I hate COVID and like this get healthy and don't get everybody else sick. Like, Mm. please let there be football. Please let there be football. Um, Yeah, I I really don't even know what to say. This this is a world that has become a world that changes every day. Yeah. Every day there is something new. And we were talking about it. Uh, before, right before we started recording about um, how the different organizations were holding and how the MLB has just turned into a complete dumpster fire in the way that they've handled this whole pandemic. And that's putting it nicely. That's putting it nicely. And then you have the NBA, who I believe has handled it perfectly. They've kicked out the teams that suck. They've brought in the teams that are salvageable and have a chance. And they're saying, hey, you can't see anybody for three months and we're paying you to play basketball. Good luck. You're getting tested every day. That's good. Yeah. By the way, basketball is back tonight, so that's pretty exciting. I just think somewhere in the middle, the NFL um, is probably on the same scale of Major League Baseball in that there are a lot of players. There are there are probably – there are definitely more players. There's a lot more personnel. So there's a lot more room for error. And that's what scares me the most. Mm-hmm. However, if we're speaking frankly here, I think there's just too much money for yes. there to not be an NFL season. So without a doubt, there's there's going to be football. Um, how good is it going to be? I don't know. But we're still here yes, to give you the are. advice. <laughs> I think without a shadow of a doubt, there's football. I at least to start it whether or not covid gets bad enough that they have to cancel if half the league gets sick i mean we're not gonna i'm not gonna speculate on that all i'm gonna say is i am confident in the in when i say that i believe that there will be football this season i it's not gonna be in a a bubble dome like the nba is um it doesn't mean it can't be done it just means that it's gonna have a lot more hair on it to be done successfully um but either way, at the end of the day, for what it means for fantasy football is you need to have an excellent commissioner. I hope everybody does. And you need to hopefully put in some rules and regulations that are specifically catered to COVID. And I think we're going to run. I don't know if you guys are first round fantasy, but we're planning an upcoming pod that's specifically, I think, just going to be like our recommended advice for what commissioners or league or fantasy football um, people can take into consideration or our recommendations for what things leagues should do and commissioners should do to, to cater to COVID in a lot of ways. I'll so. tell you right now, that sounds like a great idea, but I would wait until the last minute to do it. Because oh yeah. Oh, we're talking about it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, who knows? We're not, it's not worth doing now. It's funny though. Like you go online, you, uh, Twitter, every, every like NFL, fantasy football analyst is already tweeting back and forth and putting ideas like what are you guys doing for COVID? What are you doing for COVID? So everybody is just like kicking ideas around in the sandbox right now. It's good stuff. But it's good stuff. Football football will be here. It'll just uh, time will tell how it pans out this season. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it Gabriel, might be a little dirty, but we're going to get it done. Absolutely. Well, Gabriel, you were nice enough to uh, come on and join us and fill in for Alex as he is a new father. Um, Tell him congratulations, by the way. I will. Or, you know, we're going to make him sit and wait and he can hear it himself from you. <laughs> but I want to give you the spotlight. Tell everybody why they should uh, consider or go listen to First Round Fantasy. Oh, man. That don't. Why? I just put you on the that, spot like that. Yeah, you did. Now I'm stumbling over my words. People are like, wait, why did you do this? This guy is clearly a stutterer and doesn't know what he's talking about. No. So who are you? Uh, why should we give you a listen? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you, first of all, uh, having me on the show. Um, and like I said, we're, we're in the similar field, right? We're in the world of fantasy football. At First Round Fantasy, we do exactly what you guys are doing. We're just a bunch of guys who 
are into fantasy football, who have taken a liking to it, who may have a little too much time on their hands. Ah. Uh, but because of that, we we started a podcast and we do or we're getting started on, you know, a lot of the big things that everyone else is doing out there. So that'll be interesting, such as rankings and draft analysis. But I just think overall, we give fresh takes. Some of them might be a little too salty and hot for some people to understand and comprehend. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's fantasy. It's a game of luck. So come over, have a good time with us. We talk a lot of crap. Uh, but we do give good advice at the end of the day. So uh, if you're interested, first round fantasy, uh, that's the same handle for everything. YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, we're on all three. Uh, so search us up and we'll be happy that you came. And what uh, what podcast hosting platforms can we find you on? Are you on Apple, Spotify? Are you on yeah, all of the normal right? regular suspects? Yeah, right now we're on YouTube. Uh, currently, and I shouldn't say currently, currently we're on YouTube, uh, getting into Spotify. So you'll be able to catch us on Spotify in the next two weeks or so. And we do host two days a week. So be on the lookout. We've got a lot of content coming your way. Absolutely. And again, and we're only getting better by the way, right? Just like the fantasy football cycles. Not to say you guys are bad. Of course you guys are great. But we're all in this together and we're all improving together. So if you're seeing us as we're like these nestled little eggs. We just need some love. Yeah, our mother flew away. So we're just kind of figuring it out on our own, right? Give us a little time. Let us nurture ourselves. And and we're going to be great one day. Uh, Right now, we're a work in progress. All right. Well, as everybody nurtures themselves, we're going to transition to the social media page. Please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. There is a TikTok, as always. We are at the (laughs) FF Sackos everywhere, uh, available on every listening platform. You can listen to any podcast. Um, Thank you, guys. Thank you for joining us. Thank you again, Gabriel Miramontes of First Round Fantasy. Have a good night. Thank you for having me.